Hi everybody, welcome to another Have You Ever Heard, our first Have You Ever Heard in a serious minute. Before we go any further, I do want to ask that you click that like button, make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel, and please consider sharing this with your friends. The conversation today is one I'm really excited about. I taped this in November of 2020 and I've held it until now. It's a conversation with a Dove-nominated uh, singer-songwriter, Pam Mark Hall, you may not know her solo work, but you definitely know her songwriting. Um, huge songs for people like Amy Grant, The Imperials, Russ Taff, Kathy Tricoli, the list goes on and on. Some of the biggest records of the 80s had Pam Mark Hall compositions on them. And we got together to talk about her last major label release in 1986 called Keeper, an album that's been really important to me. Uh, in developing my own spiritual ethos down through the years. And I wanted to hear from her, her experience uh, as a woman in contemporary Christian music. She was going against the grain uh, of the norms and the ways that people approached um, writing about life and spirituality within the Christian music market. Pam had a very different approach along with women I've written about in the past, like Kathy Tricoli, Jermaine Hawkins, uh, Amy Grant, Sheila Walsh. Their approach was different. It was not conventional. It was not typical. And uh, I wanted to chronicle Pam's story uh, for you. So I hope you enjoy. We did not have a formal start to our conversation. Uh, we jumped right in talking about Keeper. So I wanted to make sure you had a little context for who she is and why her music matters before you jump into this conversation that I know you're going to love. And Keeper is is my gospel album i mean if yeah. of all my all my product that would be my statement of faith record wow even though the early records are very very specific about my what the elements of my faith are those were records of certainty and keeper is a record of questions and mystery mm. if i could summarize it in that way well, that was my big observation about keeper was that to me it's like a um line of delineation in your work because the early albums were very um folk centered very scripture centered in a lot of ways yes. and then uh you came into the 80s with this record which is for mu musically very different from what you've done in the uh, with the first two projects, but it is also you start telling really um, introspective stories in a lot of ways, and so you're, it marks this one marks a shift in your writing, and then supply and demand, which is musically again such a leap uh, oh, for no. you. This is like your 80s synth pop rock oh record. Yeah. Um, I mean, that record for me, that wasn't a me record. That was a Keith Thomas record. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, okay, Keith, take her and see what you can do with her. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. You know, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. But it's, it's more him than it is me. Well, it's very left of center from where who you had been to your audience for a long time. Yeah. Which was what the 80s were. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other thing about it is I couldn't, I couldn't, in concert, I had to use tracks. I couldn't perform the songs. And that was really awkward for me because I'd always played the guitar and piano and, um, it would be funny, I could, uh, which song was it? Uh, Find the Glory There. Yep. I wrote that song like a James Taylor song. It was wow. very folky. Wow. And Keith turned it into a Laura Branigan yes. kind of thing, you know. And I, I loved Laura Branigan at the time. Mm -hmm. But where is she now? And that music is not sustainable well i compared 
when we were, I sent over the questions before we talked, one of the things, I think I said this, I compared it to um, Melissa Manchester's mathematics record, which was uh, produced by George Duke, you know, which was such a shift for somebody like yeah. Melissa Manchester, who like you was a piano guitar centered artist. And it created this, you know, synthesized sound, but at the core, and that's what made this record to me really still work, was that in the, at the center of all of that elaborate production was your songs. And you still had the I, content. I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm proud of the songs. Well, so coming off of that record, which had you know, a major hit, particularly with Sparrow Watcher um, and The Agony and the Glory, as well i think it was also a single um i think so mm -hmm. so coming off of that record and the fact that you had also written major songs for other people between 84 and 86 i mean you had um you were on i believe four of the five grammy nominated records in 80 between 84 and 85. i know uh, they, i did the imperials um and that that, and I've sang background vocals on that one too. And yes. it blows me away when I listen to it. I mean, it's like atmospheric. Um, yes. And such a great song, Holding We're referring to Holding yeah. On from this year's yeah. Mob. I forgot. <laughs> such, a, I mean, that is such a, a huge, huge song to just listen to musically. The vocal performance, but also, I mean, it's that, Pam Mark Hall thing, the way you summarize what is, when, when you hear the song, you go, God, yes, that's such a simple feeling, but it takes such skill to articulate those thoughts in such, wow. a, con such a concise and um, accessible way. Because I don't remember the lyrics. I mean, the way that happened was Brown, I think it was Brown, it was either Brown or Keith, uh, was, I think it was Brown, anyway, producing the Imperials. Mm -hmm. And he called me and said, <clears throat> I'm tracking the song tomorrow. Oh, I've got the track done and we're doing the vocals tomorrow and we don't have lyrics. <laughs> Can you write them? I wrote them overnight. Wow. You know, um, that was, I love that. It was so much fun uh, to get calls like that. Well, I had, I interviewed uh, also for the season, Tori Taff, and we talked about medals and that's what ended up happening with God Only Knows from medals. Right, who was producing that one? That um, was uh, uh, Jack Joseph. Um, Greg. Greg, thank you. So I, who who called me? Did Russ call me? I yeah. don't remember. She said they called you uh, because they had like the idea of what they wanted the song to say, but did not have time to um, put pen to paper because they were on a deadline. And she mm -hmm. said, you turned that song around, I believe she said in like 48 hours. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and one of five singles from that record um and you also wrote another favorite and that's why, and that's why i'm living in a double wide <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> gave me enough for my down payment <laughs> right okay well and we also wrote another uh song on a grammy nominated record that year kathy tricoli's heart and soul you wrote the song open my eyes um, another one that is just one of those like straight to the heart. We have all experienced this situation. We have not all been able to write songs about it. And you know, it's really weird. I have such little memory of that one. And isn't, I think it was a co-write with me and Amy and Michael W. That's Smith. Right. That's right. I don't, I mean, you would think I co-wrote a song with Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. You'd think I'd have some memory of it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how it happened. 
Well, I think it speaks to, though, the volume of work you were creating during this period. I mean, you were right. And there are many other songs. I mean, you've got cuts on Rob Frazier. You've got cuts on First Call. You've got. Yes. Oh, yeah. That one. Double Talk. Do you remember Double, I mean, I do double, remember double, double Talk? Yeah, and I think there was another one. I wrote that one with Shane Keister. Double Talk. Okay. Yeah, you know who Shane Keister is. Yeah, it's been I playing mean, on, I mean, session player galore. Yeah. And I remember going out to his house out in the country, and uh, they turned the uh, garage into a studio. And we sat, I sat next to him on the piano bench. And we just wrote it in an afternoon. Wow. Wow. Those... Those, I haven't thought about this in 30 years. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, in given that, I mean, you were in, you were in such a creative, um, I hate to use this word, high, like you were just creating so much and getting ready then to prepare for another solo record with Keeper. Um, what was on your mind? What did you know you wanted to do as you were conceptualizing or, or knowing you were about to make a record? What was on your heart? What were you wanting to generate? Well, I definitely wanted to get away from techno pop. You know, it just techno pop just is, isn't my genre. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> even though I love the songs, most of the songs. Um, so I've given a lot of thought to this. First of all, you asked in your questions about having a mindset about crossing over. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd had that mindset ever since I moved to Nashville. Wow. And, um, actually, the first, in the first year or two, I was working with a producer named Norbert Putnam, mm -hmm. who, you know, he's played bass with Elvis. Uh, he produced Dan Fogelberg. He was a part of the Nashville Sound mm -hmm. group. And <clears throat> Norbert produced two sides on me. Mm -hmm. And um, one was a co-write with Rich Mullins, who at the time, he hadn't had his first record, right. you know, so... I'm, I'm bringing Rich along, you know, yeah. into the picture. And I think he would say it the same way. Um, <clears throat> and we, and so that was my desire all mm -hmm. the, all the way along. Um, so you asked me how I met Wendy Waldman. Mm -hmm. So I met Wendy through Norbert. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so, and supply and demand, we, per, we recorded that at the Bennett house. Yes. And Norbert Putnam, Putnam owned the Bennett house. Yes. So while I was recording, I was staying there. Okay. And Wendy had moved to Nashville. And so when we were coming, Walk by Faith mm -hmm. is the song. Now, I, I, I really like that song. I think even, I think that, um, I think Keith got out of the way enough to allow the, uh, what's the word I want? Um, the organic, no, mm -hmm. the organicness of it. I co-wrote it with Mark Gershmill from Whiteheart. Right. Anyway, so Norbert recommended Wendy to me as a background vocalist on Walk by Faith. Wow. Yeah. And then one, once we connected, then, oh, I thought, oh, I've got to have Wendy on, um, oh, Hey Child. She's on Hey Child. She's on Agony and the Glory. Yeah. Yes. Along with Bonnie Keen. <clears throat> Bonnie Keen. And on, and I have to add, like Walk by Faith, I mean, these background vocalists, this is no joke. You've got Wendy Waldman, Bonnie Keene, yourself, Kathy Tricoli, Greg Guidry, and Chris Harris. You, you remember Greg Guidry, don't you? Yes. 
I mean, he yeah. was like the Michael McDonald. That's right. Down the leg. Yes. But he was hot there for a while. I don't remember what the single was. You're right. Mega vocalist. Mega vocalist. Yeah. So that's how you and Wendy connected. That's when we connected. And then when thinking, when it was time to do another album, I just thought I really, really liked Wendy. And uh, I don't know, I just decided to ask her if she would produce the next record. Wow. And at the time she was working with, um, she had just, her first production was the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. And then she was working with the New Grass Revival, who had Bella Fleck, yes. John Cowan, um, uh, Douglas, Jerry Douglas. I mean, Major. Major. So um, I went and hung out in the studio with her while she was producing that. And, I, and we just hit it off. Wow. So then um, I don't remember how many songs I had, but I, there were quite a few. See, Rich and I had um, written Jordan. Mm -hmm. Weeds Grow in My Garden Days are uh, Weeds Grow in My Days. Uh, long. Days hot and long. Old hot song long. makes this clay harden. The work will make me strong. So that attitude of yeah, life's a bitch, but yeah. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna frame it in such a way that it will empower me, yes. and that was the whole intent of that song. Wow. Um, and Rich just got it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I have to say, of all my collaborators, that he was my favorite. Wow. Just because collaborating is. Collaborating is a very intimate yes. uh, experience. I mean, I've gotten together with major hit writers who, you know, you think, okay, well, I need to write with, and I'm thinking of in the secular world, mm -hmm. they have number one hits. Yeah. I'm going to get together and write with them. Nothing, just nothing. But whenever Rich and I got together, it was like we just went into this zone wow. and there were no, it, it was like what C.S. Lewis talks about, his concept of heaven would be that we will have no boundaries. We will actually be able to walk inside of each other yes. and know, know and be known. Yes. And that was, that was how it felt with Rich. Wow. I what? mean, we, we worked on a song, it was called Maybe You Could Love Me. <laughs> and it was a concept that he had. He wanted to write this Broadway musical. Wow. And the uh, protagonist was a pterodactyle. <laughs> wow. So this song, Maybe You Could Love Me, was from a pterodactyl's perspective. Wow. Maybe you could love me if I just don't show it. Uh, I mean, just if, if I'm not vulnerable, if I'm not this, if I'm not that. But I don't have a problem with pretending I'm a pterodactyl. Right. <laughs> right. Um, wow. So he, it, I really treasured those, the memories of writing with him. Well, and you also, I think, you know, talking about collaboration is important because, you know, you also wrote with um, Wendy and um, Craig Bickhart. Craig Bickhart, uh, Dave Perkins on this record, um, Tom Campbell on several songs, and uh, Carlotta McGee was a co writer on this as a test as well. So tell me about, as you were entering, because you were doing something that was also really unique uh, because Christian music did not, I mean, this is, I keep trying to think back about other albums produced by women um, in contemporary Christian. And this is really the first one I can come up with 
Um, and so this was a really, you know, in the, in, you know, um, happening simultaneous to you all was like the women's uh, music movement, which exactly. was about women creating music with other yeah. women. And you were bringing that idea into um, contemporary Christian music. And I find that so interesting. And Wendy was, Wendy is Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I loved that because this is moving into another stage yeah. where my whole concept of spirituality, the walls were just kick, getting yes. kicked down. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that later. But with Wendy, <clears throat> we saw eye to eye mm -hmm. spiritually. So the concepts that we were trying to communicate are universal truths. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so anyone could listen to it and be spiritually evoked. Yes. Without having to be defensive. Well, that's what I find so unique. Is why I make this album, this line of... Um, it's a shift in your work in a major way because I love the element of surprise you keep having in the lyrics. I mean, you talk a lot about God showing up in unexpected places, Jesus showing up in um, ways that people at the time in particular were not talking about. Uh, right. Jesus in the street is such a great example of that. And you were connecting the idea of spirituality with social justice you know and and nature you know which was also you know not done a lot those connections were not made i think you and terry Desario are like two of the only writers making those connections in ccm mm. at that time um and in uh, the sense of wonder that you keep that shows up multiple times in this project i love the element of surprise um like wow god is here too yeah um that's a good way to put it i'm just so moved that you've paid such close attention to all of that wow because um I had been told by management, look, uh, just be an artist. You know, why do you have to, why do you have to make everything about, why are you trying to change the world? Mm -hmm. You know, I had, we had this one experience where we, um, how do I say it without being negative about the person? Um, we pulled into a parking garage together and there was no ticket taker and there was no ticket to take. So I parked, we went and did what we were going to do. And then we got in the car and as we left, there's a, there's a booth. Mm -hmm. That'll be $10, ma'am. And I said, what do you mean there'll be $10? <laughs> I said, there's, there's no notice at the front, you know, that I'm going to have to pay. I'm sorry, ma'am, you can't leave until you pay your $10. And I said, well, I would like to register a complaint with your management. And, and so we, I paid the $10, we're leaving, and my manager said, you know, can't you just be an artist and not, not have to try to you know, all the social justice stuff and change the world. And basically just shut up and sing. You know, mm -hmm. that's the message that I got. Just shut up and sing. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work recently and realize that was, that's the message that I'd gotten my whole life. Yes. Just shut up and sing. Don't want to hear what you have to say. Just look pretty and sing, mm -hmm. entertain us. Um, 
and I've never been very good at that. <laughs> of, I mean, social justice, that, that was just, uh, I grew up in the Episcopal Church and my particular priest was very social justice minded. So I brought that with me. That's right. That's right. I was going to interrupt. Uh, I, you did. And I think that, you know, uh, Jesus in the street, you saw him in the alley, no shoes on his feet, begging for a quarter or something he could eat. Was it my imagination or did I just meet Jesus in the street? Uh, saw her in the ghetto, money was spent, a woman with three children, no man to pay the rent. Neglected, unwanted, could be, I think I see Jesus in the street. And so this whole, it's something that would become really popular like 30 years later when people would read a book like The Shack. And, uh, you know, a sudden it was a, a big revelation about the um, shape-shifting or so of God, you know, that God could be, you know, people, you know, people that we see every day that we are not um, fighting for or with, you know, their place. Didn't Jesus say, when you do this to the least of me, you've done it unto me. And that was the whole concept I was trying to put across. Um, well, and on that level, like, as a, it's interesting that at the time, the, the line that you were supposed to play within that business was not that, you know. I made people really uncomfortable. I still do. <laughs> well, but I think, you know, when I was sitting here listening to this, it's one of the records that I continually come back to um, wow. in my life. And it is because as it ages, the messages become more um, vital because it's really clear we did not get it the first time around. Um, and so when I, you know, we've been living through a, a really awful election cycle. And all I kept coming back to were albums like this one. I was listening to Terry DeSerio's Voices in the Wind with songs like I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. You know, really you all were, the, the few artists of you that were really pressing against the norms were really warning us about the dangers of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And that's really the passive message I hear in this record by turning our attention to, you know, I keep going back to this one too, because it's such a gorgeous song, but that message, Unexpected Places, you're trying to say like, hey, God is not, or my perception, let me know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, my perception of it was, yeah, don't buy into every place they're telling you God is. Try looking over here because it might be someplace else. Yes, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about what was the response, you know, when you wanted to bring Wendy Waldman to the table um, as a okay. producer? Um, Blanton and Harold, you know, were excited about it. Okay. They thought, they thought that could possibly help us mm -hmm. um, cross over. But um, the thing is that crossover where <laughs> you know because this even though it's not a quote-unquote gospel record it is very spiritual and it's very um it's not just you know celebrate good times come on you know it's not that it's thinking not provoking huh yeah. thinking music yeah um, so one of my very favorite songs on the record is Keeper of the Vision. Yes. Yes. And that just continues um, the whole message of, you know, where do we find value and whose job is important, you mm -hmm. know, and um, where is God in all of it? And how does God uh, connect with my value as a human being and, and my role and the whole concept of you're the keeper of the vision. It's like it, it's every person is special and has their own yes. little part to play, 
you know, some people will be doctors and some will be street sweepers, but you can take whatever that is and infuse it with meaning and power. And that's, I have listened to that song over and over. I've held on to that yes. probably more than any song on, on, my, that, on that record and my whole career, I think, because through the years of, of telling myself, you're the keeper of the vision, hold on, hold on, you know, yeah. keep the flame going. Um, and Wendy and Craig Bickhart, oh my gosh, he's just a phenomenal guitar player um, and writer. Yes. An artist in and of himself. It was just magical. It was just a magical collaboration. Well, and that, we've been having a lot of conversations about um, a lot of the values that are now and probably were then, but I, I was a you know a little younger then, so I wasn't. I'm not quite so clear on what all the norms were when I was a child growing up in a fundamentalist home. But now there's such an emphasis on wealth, power, fame, um, in a sense. You know that these are then indicators of favor, God blessed you, yes. or blessings. Yes, and so what Keeper also to me really t speaks to is um, the concept of reward. You know, what is the reward? It's more of a um, open-ended question in a sense, saying what is, um, you're the keeper of the vision, what does that mean? You're rich, you're poor, you win, you lose. Where does that position us in this hierarchy of what we believe are indicators of our placement with God? And again, you're just like tipping that on its head and saying, no, it's, it's, it's in every walk. It's not about a particular um, range of people. You know, it's not selective. It's, it's micro and, you know, macro. You said a word there about the hierarchy. And in your questions to me, you said what was going on. Mm -hmm. And bottom line I was in a group of women. There were 10 of us. And we met weekly for six years. And the woman who led it was a woman named Cheryl James Andrews. She's a huge part of my story. Um, <clears throat> she was the Christian ed director at a, a very fundamentalist church I and many other Christian musicians went to. And she started reading books and bringing them to us. And one of the very first, and I've told you about this before, is When Society Becomes an Addict ah. by Anne, uh, Anne Wilson Schaefe. Ann Wilson Schaefe, S-C-H-A-E-F. Okay. Okay. When society becomes an addict, and okay, so the it's about the addictive system. Mm. And we are so, so engaged in the addictive system right now. <laughs> um, okay, so she defines the addiction. She defines system, uh, the illusion of control, crisis orientation, depression, stress, um, it just, it goes into how our whole entire system is a hierarchy based on white male privilege. Yep. So um, it's built on a hierarchical system mm -hmm. and I began, it resonated with what I already believed. Yes. Um, and having come up in a liberal church who, you know, I never heard woman submit, you know, never heard that. Um, <clears throat> I had been, 
since I had been married, that was a continual problem. Mm. You know, if I didn't agree with him, he could use the Bible and say, woman, submit. You know, it was in the church that I went to, adhered to that. Even if he hits you, turn the other cheek. Yeah. So, okay, there was that one. And then I found this one, The Dance of Anger. Oh boy. By Harriet Goldman Lerner, PhD. Uh, the Dance of Anger is a careful and compassionate exploration of women's anger. It will be extremely useful to almost every reader. And I, I, she helped me start naming. I mean, I knew I was angry, but I didn't know what to do with that or what to attach it to or what the real issue was. And I began understanding all those things. And... I, I, it wasn't up here yet, but my entire being was screaming, this is not right. Wow. This hierarchy, this male dominance, this misogyny. Yes. And I actually, when I left him, the only reason the church accepted it was because he was screwing around, you know, but that wasn't why I was divorcing him. I was divorcing him because of the misogyny, right? Of the of that abuse and the the adultery is, was just a symptom of that, That's right? right? About control. So when I went to my record label and said, you know, I've left him. Well, you know, they want to know why, and I said, well, he's misogynistic. Oh my God, you should, you could see their eyes roll to the back of their heads. You know? <laughs> I said the M word. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? They say, you know, and, you know, so at that juncture and that's, that happened right after uh, I finished Keeper. Finished. Okay. Um, it was all unraveling mm -hmm. while I was recording. Um, wow. But, oh my gosh, then. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Women Who Want Run Women With The Wolves. With the wolves. Yes. And, and one of the, the archetypes in there is Bluebeard. Right. And Bluebeard is, you know, is representative of the strong, um, successful, uh, competent provider. Mm -hmm. And so, and so he convinces you that he's going to take care of you. And so you agree to that. And then once you are in that commitment, he says, don't you ever open that door. Yeah. And don't you open that door. That's right. And All if you do, you know, so I began realizing that was the church, at least the, the, the fundamentalist evangelical church that I, I was captive to, and I don't know how it happened because I was just a, you know, a hippie girl, Jesus freak, love Jesus, Jesus, you know, Jesus is for the little guy. What is all this? This has nothing to do with my concept of Jesus. Right. Right. And that is what that album represents to me. Well, and yeah, I find this really, there's an interesting thing that clearly I think several of you were going through at the same time because there is a handful, are a handful, sorry, uh, there are a handful of albums that came out between 86 and 87 that I've always called, and this, may, this so these are my words, not y'all's words, I want to make sure okay. people know that. 
like I consider them agnostic um, Christian albums. <laughs> I agree. I, I agree. Was Leslie Phillips the turning in there? Absolutely. Okay. The, okay. Yes. <laughs> Which came after Keeper. We should also know it came after Keeper by like six months, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, Keeper Keeper is probably the first that I, well, this came out the same time as Terry DeSerio, Voices in the Wind, um, same year. Both of those albums, I consider them to be the deconstructionist manual. Um, and then you add the turning to that and then the, the self-titled Russ Taff record and you've got like your first beginnings of the unraveling of everything you ever thought was true. And then, and then what happened with Russ? I mean, he went back in. Yes. He, he, yeah, it was too scary out here. Yeah. Um, I mean, bless him, but yeah. Where else was where else was he going to make a living with that voice? Well, and this is something I think you know. This is we didn't. This wasn't on our list. I didn't know we were going to go here, but this is an interesting point because one of the other conversations we have in our house quite regularly is the role that um, oh, I hate bringing this word up. The role that <laughs> capitalism <laughs> really plays in upholding faith in the way that we know about faith. And so how many talented people had invested 10 and 15 years in a form of music you believed in, a message you believed in, to then be greeted with a change in um, power, ultimately. And gatekeepers, right? Gatekeeper. Hurdles. That you then had to either make big concessions with or walk away and so there was a big walk away in these years I mean you moved on Leslie moved on Terry moved on and you all really were like the last of that mystic poetic voice the wow. feminine voice in many ways that was really balancing out this militaristic uh, misogynistic <laughs> Uh, and there were men who had that voice too. I mean, Russ was definitely, because I, and Tori and I had this conversation, she brought that feminine balance to his approach. And so you've got, you know, artists like you all, and then you've got the other ones that I won't name that were more fundamental, like basically in fatigues, you know, warring for the kingdom. And it was a battling of structures and, and you all took a whole nother path outside of that and other people were stuck in the middle ultimately because of money exactly and um i have to say that you know um because terry and leslie and i uh were disenfranchised i guess I, is yeah. a word to use that you know, we, we had to figure something else out early on, right? Yes. So there was a small window of time for us to uh, reconstruct, redevelop. And I think of the people that, um, you know, at that time, I don't think, I didn't feel any empathy at all coming from the CCM family none mm -hmm. it's like you're on your own girl and now you know when when it hits they were still able to go out in their 40s you know and sing little churches and do these things and bring enough in and now they're in their 60s and what the hell am i gonna do yeah yeah you know? How, how am I going to survive? Because, hey, I've been independent all my life. I don't have any social security because I never paid in. You know, so it's a huge crisis, I think. Um, I'm just watching it from the outside. But, you know, I see 
artists who were really, or producers or whatever, who were the it people, now they have positions at universities. Yes. yes. They've got a paycheck. What happened to all those artists that she produced? We have to also talk about the impact of, uh, and, and a lot of people I'm sure that are going to watch this don't know these things exist in Christian music. Because when you are really, you know, you're just a, and I, I mean this with all respect, when you are just a believer who is a believer, and that's just, the, you know, what you believe, it's what you are, it's, where, it's your identity, you don't recognize that ageism is real within this business. You don't recognize that um, um, sexism is real in this business. You don't realize that women are being told when they're 25 that they're too old to be in this business. Good God, really? Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, these are realities that are happening. It's invisible because people are also compliant and don't discuss it. Uh, and it's also because the leaders say, God told me this, God told me that. Now, how am I going to argue with that? I prayed about, you know, how much money to spend on promotion. And, and uh, I can't give you, I could give you a figure, but if you just trust God, it would be more. <laughs> <laughs> And so in 1986, you had also seen people's careers end over divorces. Mine. And then Sandy, you were... It was, Sandy Patty was not too long after that. After you, I mean, and there was Reba before you, Michelle Pilar before you. I mean, people, and I'm not saying anything that's not, you know, p things people haven't talked about to death. Um, and so these were career crossroads in many ways. So when you are finishing a record, I think that makes you a little rare in that sense because you're finishing what was probably being poised to be a breakthrough, another breakthrough for you, and you have this news. What happens then? You know, how do they handle that? A week later, they dropped me from the label. Well, there we go. Because they prayed about it mm. and God told them not to do any more records with me. Wow. But we'd like you to stick around and keep writing songs for our publishing company so that Kim Hill could record them. Wow. I can't say what I said to them. <laughs> well, it's an interesting thing because it then becomes, you know, then and I find that story and you and I have talked about this through the years. I mean, I find that story so interesting because there's always someone they are ready to bring in that does not know what they're walking into, that does not know they are now being groomed for the same kind of treatment. Yes, and as I, I've looked at some interviews with Kim, she didn't know anything about me. I mean, right. you know, she's not a part of my issue. Right. But I look at the timeline and they had already decided. Yeah. Before I went in there, you know, and told them that I was getting divorced, they were already grooming her right. for my spot. Yeah. Well, and this you this is something you and I have talked about as well um, through the years. And I, I used this when I wrote my undergraduate thesis, you know, and mm -hmm. you were a focus of that. You made such an astute comment about there's only room for one. And that's true. And she, you know, there, a room for a folky kind of person. And, you know, Pam's 35, getting a divorce, and, you know, her sales aren't that great. I think we'll give that spot to, uh, I think Kim was probably 10, 10 to 12 years younger than me, yeah. you know. Um, and again, this has nothing to do no. with Kim. Um, it's about the reality of, you know, this gives us a good out. And, um, okay, fine. But could you just be effing honest about it? You know, yeah. then, rather than putting God on it. 
Yes. Well, and it's also, you know, it's it's interesting that you start this album, and I'm assuming you wrote this song before any of this went down. Uh, I'm hanging on, but just by a thread. This is how this album opens. This is the opening <laughs> line on this album. And I, in retrospect, having known some of the, your backstory, I always found yeah. it so kind of ironic and humorous that this is, you know, the first line. I'm hanging on by, uh, but just by a thread. Is there a sun above this cloud overhead? I can't find my way. It's blacker than night. It's one of those days when nothing goes right. So much I want to change, I don't understand. Some things are out of my hands. This is a test, only a test. The world isn't coming to an end. Wow. <laughs> profound yeah and so like prophetic for what you would you know what ultimately making this record would bring what about I was for walking you. into yeah 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 uh, well i'll tell you what <clears throat> Gosh, 86, how long ago was that? That's almost. It's 35 um, years. It's been messy. <laughs> it's It's been real messy, but I would do it all over again. I mean, you know, I'm so glad that I got out. I'm so glad. Well, I mean, your path, you do, the, the really interesting thing about you is that you can do so many other things. And so you, you know, I know a little bit about what happened for you after this and you, you know, you painted houses for a while. Cleaned out, painted, cleaned houses, home wallpaper, you know. Um, you got a job then as marketing uh, director, right? Is that the position with the Salvation Army? You worked with the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. um, and... and Go ahead. Task Force Against Domestic Violence. And uh, I was there for three years. Um, yeah. Well, in music, what I love about your path too is that it took you off of, I think, this roller coaster that a lot of artists experience, which is that make a record every year, make a record every two years, you know, that roller coaster of having to produce. And so what you have produced over the last 30 years has been so rich Thank because I'm the living life. <laughs> and they're more isolated. You don't have to create just because you get to create or because it's expected of you. You get to create because you want to. Mm -hmm. And so we've gotten wonderful. I mean, you Paler Shade, which came out in the 90s. I want to point people to these records because these are really important pieces of your path. I mean, if you loved the very early records, you've got to follow that trajectory all the way through because it's a, there's a storyline that connects mm. your albums together. What um, is that storyline? Well, the storyline is, is that, <laughs> from my standpoint, what your music says to me is Jesus Christ may be the same yesterday, today, and forever, but the way that we understand that and the way that we live that is not. Wow, that's great. Yes. I'll use that. That's good. I mean, it's been difficult, you know, um, to know how to refer to myself in terms of when people ask me about my faith. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I really don't relate at all to what the American Christian church is or, or what they're projecting about Christianity. To me, it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And that's the whole reason I got, I mean, no, uh, nobody gets to tell me. Yes. Nobody gets to tell me what my experience with Jesus or God is. That's up to me and God. That's right. Well, and I think that it's, I, I wanted to ask you this too, because it feels like having come, you came from the Jesus movement, which I think was such a pure, um, it was. yeah, it was such a pure understanding of 
spirit, you know, of who God was and how that relationship was, is a personal relationship and how that can direct your life. You all were not, however, separatists. You know, you were not separatists. You understood the importance of talking to people that did not hold the same values, that understood the world differently, because you were already people who had understood the world differently. You know, and what's interesting is I've discovered different playlists of the songs that I used to do. Mm -hmm. And it was a total mix. And what they weren't all Christian songs. Right. You know, they were, it was, why do you have to be afraid to talk in language that is comfortable for the culture? That's why, right. and you just called it separatist, mm -hmm. right? Well, I think part of the reason that purity was there was because it, it uh, emerged from the whole peace movement. Agreed. And I, I think that it, that it was a carryover, love, love you know brother peace yes it was all a part of that and for us it was like oh you want peace and love well jesus is the answer mm -hmm. and that was all there was to it yeah that's all there was to it you know and um then 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 it got too smart you know it, it got too um back into what originated the rebellion in the first place that created the peace movement, which is structure and hierarchy and misogyny. That's right. That's right. And we're right back there. We're worse than it was. Worse than it was. And oh my gosh, it's like if you're a Democrat, you're a murderer. Yeah. If you're a Democrat, you're a, you know, uh, you're going to hell. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And I, I want to, you know, point out, I mean, I have interviewed over the last six years, many of your contemporaries and your concern over this is shared amongst others within that emerged from the Jesus movement. I mean, this is you, you are not on that level a singular voice, but what people listen to, what people choose to glob onto are the male voices. They choose to listen to the men who are screaming about Trump. And I'm just using that as an example of one of many problems we have, but they, that type of leadership as what they want. And I believe it is, you know, it is inextricably connected to the misogyny and the racism that you've talked about through this entire conversation. I'm not naming names. Yeah. But I recently saw a picture of uh, a man mm -hmm. who used to be in CCM, mm -hmm. who's now a pastor. And he was very proud of the fact that he wedded his daughter with a gun stuck, right? No, I'm serious. The picture was him all slicked up with his gun mm. presiding over this wedding because it's my right. It's my God-given right. And... Mm. No, I don't allow women to speak in the church. I'm going, what? I mean, how? How? Wow. wow. So, oh, I know what I forgot that I was wanting to say. Mm -hmm. When I was going through all of this, I felt so alone. Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, I wasn't talking with Sam Phillips Right. I wasn't talking with Reba. I wasn't talking with Sandy Patty. I didn't know any of their experience. So, you know, when I left my husband, the phone stopped ringing. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I had a few people reach out, but my point is, 
all of this that I was experiencing, the misogyny, the hierarchy, and all of that, I thought it was singular. I thought, you know. Yes, yes. And it's taken me all this time to realize it was systemic and affecting everyone. Yeah. And, you know, how could it take me 30 years to figure out, you know, it wasn't just because I was a bad girl. It was because I figured out, I fi you know, I busted them. I mean, yeah, I busted them. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and it's part of what happens to anyone, any of us that have gone through abuse. Um, and most of us that, that go through this, it is, it some, and on some level, it ends up becoming spiritual, physical, and emotional. <laughs> you know, you all, you, it almost always happens together. And you do think it is only happening to you because you've also been groomed and conditioned to only see it happening to you. You know, you think that what you are experiencing is singular to you and you can't see it happening to other people, even though it is. Because what it also does is it turns us against each other. And so, you know, it goes back to there can only be one. It goes back to, you know, why would you have, why would you have formed relationships, really strong relationships with other women that you had been conditioned to be competitive with? Oh boy, now you're touching on something that I've been writing about. <clears throat> a revelation. Mm -hmm. It has been revealed to me by spirit um, that I have colluded all of my life in the abuse of women. Wow. It has been revealed to me as I think back over my life in this whole only room for one that I knew men disdained women. And, you know, the only ones that were respected were the beautiful ones, the, you know, mm -hmm. whatever could be an accessory, you know, to men and it's only now that i'm realizing i made a decision i made a judgment against women for my own survival wow, wow. you know that i did not have this i did not have respect my mother wow um for the value of who she was until recently of really looking at her life and seeing and realizing I minimized, I minimized her value. Um, and I put myself under that same judgment, yeah. you know? So I'm really happy that I'm developing respectful relationships with other creative women. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a creatives workshop led by Seth Godin, the okay. marketing guru. Mm -hmm. And I think I just, you know, I found when I was in high school, I found my little spot. I'm the folk singer. Mm -hmm. I was the folk singer and no one's going to take my place, you know, and so you, you uh, guard it, you protect it. Yes. And I recognize how I've done that throughout my whole life wow. with women and other artists that I could I could have really developed, a, you know, deep relationships with, but I didn't because I was threatened. Right. 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 That's no way to live. Right. That's no way to live. And just think about how much I I robbed myself of by not 
mm. digging deep into the pers- the whole person of my female friends. Wow. Wow. You know, I I was I I I, I I looked at them like men would look at them. That's what you were taught to do. I was. Yeah. And it it's so sad. It's so sad. Um, but I'm going to tell myself, this is not singular to me. Right. <laughs> it was systemic. It's a pandemic. <laughs> it's a pandemic. <laughs> now, to all the women who are out there, who I've disrespected, please wow. forgive me. Wow. And just know how much I admire you for surviving and thriving. Wow. Well, I, you know, we have, I think we've in some way answered everything I had um, about this album. And I really hope that you all really hear the deep well that Pam Mark Hall is i mean pam i've known you now we're crossing the 15 year mark and uh i've never walked away from a conversation with you and not been inspired uh enlightened i learn every time we communicate every time we talk you've been such a friend to me through these years and uh, i want to encourage people to uh i'm hoping by the time we run this Keeper might be available again for people to stream and uh, download. You signed it. You said you signed it to Tim, my dear friend and inspiration, your soul sister, Pamelita. And uh, December of 2008, if you can believe it. Wow. Yeah. It seems like two lives ago, doesn't it? Uh, can I just tack on something here? Yeah. So, um, I uh, this is my great great cousin. Her name is Dora Bell Yinkst, and she really has inspired me to open myself to. Uh, the, the voice of my ancestral, the women in my ancestor. Mm-hmm. And through her, I've discovered that my great, great, great grandmother was a Cherokee princess wow. who wow. walked the Trail of Tears. Wow. I've learned that a great, great uncle was a slave owner. Wow. All of these things. And I... I have invited my the women of my ancestry to speak to me mm-hmm. because I believe all of that we've just talked about, it's not just my voice, it's, it's their voice That's as right. well of all that they went through in dealing with these issues that probably in even more extreme ways. Yeah. You know, so I feel like they have more to say. Mm. And I feel like I'm supposed to be the conduit for that. Well, and you are working on um, a book? Mm. Yeah, I've got about 50 pages written, so 100 pages so far. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm writing it like a novel. Mm-hmm. So creative fiction. Yes. You know. Wow. And I'm looking forward to what they have to tell me. And they're the ones who informed me of how disrespectful I've been. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's such a revelation because I think most of us... Um, when we are conditioned to be certain ways in society, we never go back and evaluate it from mm-hmm. that lens. Even if we recognize it, we then just move on and, and try to make, but you, you're doing such an essential work in healing. 
essential work. I'm so continually proud of you, Pam. I mean, no. you, <laughs> you are such a, a journey, you know, your journey is continuous. You are always listening. I mean, that's the one thing I know about you is that even in really challenging times, you are always listening and getting the message. And I think that's what makes you uh, such an amazing uh, soul, but such an amazing songwriter because your ear, even working in fiction, you're working like a songwriter. You know, you are still calling on that ear and that mm -hmm. eye of yours. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I just love you. So I, I want to route people to uh, that you can find Pam in all of the music stores, Pam Mark Hall. Uh, like website too. Find that pammarkhall.com. Mm -hmm. um, I again, I'm hoping this will be available by the time we air this. Yeah, uh, it is. Keeper and uh, uh, Never Fades Away is available uh, for streaming as well. And uh, your latest work, Mangle the Tango, which is spectacular. And Thank you. Can, you know, listen to Mangle the Tango. Mangle the Tango. I can't, I'm mangling <laughs> it just trying to say it. Um, and hear where Pam is today or where she was when she made it just a few years ago. Um, yeah. And write, drop Pam a line and let her know that you appreciate the work she's doing. Thank you.